Proud to introduce Dr. Howard Hayden, Professor of Physics, University of Connecticut, and um, an outspoken, outspoken, or let's just say energetic uh, participant in the debate about climate science. And um, I could say more, but I think probably you want to listen to him. Well, it's actually uh, Professor Emeritus, uh, and I don't know if you know what the, G uh, the etymology of the term is. It means out of merit. <laughs> um, let's see here. Now, uh, what I want to do is to show you a nice little movie here to begin. By the way, my thanks to the Heartland Institute for uh, setting on this uh, wonderful uh, program. And um, they, they've done a marvelous job year after year, and uh, marvelous has gotten actually better. There's no sound in this, but uh, let's have a look here. Uh, what's uh, show, being shown there is a simple pendulum. Well, it's not. A, it's called a compound pendulum, mainly because it's a stick rather than a ball at the end of a string. Now he's taking a. Uh, um, connector out that connects the top and the bottom halves of the stick together. And what I want you to do is simply to watch the motion there. You ought to get things sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, enough. That's enough. Now, the, the upshot of that is that uh, there's that complicated motion of two sticks cannot be modeled on a computer. Do you really think that the climate can be modeled with a computer? All right, uh, now on to my presentation here. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna establish a, uh, an upper limit to the sensitivity of the, um, uh, well, it's called the sensitivity or the climate sensitivity. Uh, beginning with the IPCC hypothesis that the uh, forcing is proportional to the logarithm of C over C0. That is, if the uh, carbon dioxide concentration is initially C0 and then it increases to C, that there shall be a forcing proportional to the logarithm of that ratio. And it is given by this formula uh, that the forcing is equal to 5.35 watts per square meter times the logarithm of C over C0. And uh, a doubling would mean that C is equal to twice C0. Logarithm of 2 is 0.69315, and that's where Scott gets his figure of 4 watts per square meter. Uh, we're not going to consider that to be in dispute. Uh, the accuracy is a little bit pretentious, but well, that's of no great concern because the temperature rise that is supposed to accompany that uh, forcing uh, is uh, supposedly then proportional to the uh, forcing. But the coefficient is unknown, and if you take a known coefficient, multiply it by an unknown coefficient, you have an unknown coefficient. So the upshot is that the temperature rise, T minus T zero, which I will call delta T, is equal to some coefficient gamma times the logarithm of C over C zero, and I'm gonna call gamma the greenhouse coefficient. Gamma is unknown, but it has the dimensions of temperature. But wait, there's more. <clears throat> Water, holds CO2. There's a certain amount of solubility there. And Henry's law tells us that the uh, pressure of the gas above the water is directly proportional to the concentration rho of the gas in the water. So I introduce a constant K. But K is really a temperature dependent um, quantity uh, shown by this graph right here that I stole from Fred Goldberg because I didn't want to go to the uh, handbook of chemistry and physics and plot my own graph. 
Um, but th there's also an equation for that. Anyway, when the water warms up, CO2 goes into the atmosphere. When the water cools down, it absorbs more CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, Van Hoft's law, uh, which actually derives very simply from Boltzmann factors, says that this K, uh, which is temperature dependent, is equal to a constant multiplied by E raised to the power, some constant alpha, reciprocal T minus reciprocal T zero. All right, now that comes from Boltzmann's factors. It's just basically asking uh, how much the CO2 in the water has adequate energy to uh, escape a barrier into the atmosphere. So if I uh, do a little bit of algebra inside the braces there, what I get is alpha T minus T zero, that's plus alpha T minus T zero over T T zero. And we are talking uh, with T values somewhere in the uh, range of 300 and, and uh, delta T is of the order of, let's say a degree or two, who cares if you're dividing by 300 or 302, 301, it doesn't make any difference. So I can lump the constants alpha, T, and T0 into, a, um, uh, into one constant and say that the K of T is K0 times E raised to the delta T over a quantity tau, which has the dimensions of temperature. <clears throat> and put that together now with Henry's law, the pressure is equal to that constant times the density in the water. And the, the density of CO2 in the, in the oceans uh, is so vast, or there is so much uh, CO2 in the oceans that um, the density doesn't change if a little bit of CO2 goes into the air. So the upshot of it is that uh, the K0 times the rho is a constant, which I will call P0, because we have to have dimensions pressure on the left and the right. And now, if I take the logarithm of both sides of that, uh, first divide by P0, take the logarithm, and recognize that the concentration in the air is proportional to the pressure. What I have is that log of P over P0 is one over tau times delta T. This almost sounds like a physics lecture and I apologize for that. What I come up with is delta T is equal to tau times the logarithm of C over C0. Tau is called the temperature coefficient. Now we're gonna put those together. We have two totally different phenomena. One phenomenon tells us that if the uh, CO2 in the atmosphere rises, then the uh, uh, temperature will go up, and it follows the equation on the top. The other equation tells us that if the temperature rises, the CO2 in the atmosphere goes up according to the equation below. The only difference is we have an unknown coefficient gamma and we have an unknown coefficient tau. Let us proceed. In the upper equation, the cause is the carbon dioxide increase. The effect is the change in the temperature. In the lower equation, the cause is the change in temperature and the effect is the change in carbon dioxide. So we put these together, we have the following that the temperature rise is equal to basically the sum of two unknown coefficients times the logarithm of the concentration ratio. Now, when you hear the IPCC saying that they have detected a discernible human influence they are wrong because it is mathematically impossible to distinguish between these two effects on the basis of any known data. It can't be done. They're going around proclaiming to the world that they have squared the circle. They have done a mathematical impossibility. Okay, again, what we mean by gamma and tau. 
Uh, now we're going to do some sensitivity training. Uh, sensitivity is what the um, uh, IPCC means uh, when they say the temperature rises. It's, it's sensitivity is the temperature rise corresponding to a doubling of CO2 concentration. C over C over two, C over C zero is equal to two. The logarithm of C of two is 6.369.69315. Okay, so the sensitivity is gamma times log two. Now we're going to have a look at some data, and I'm going to look at two different uh, sources of data. Uh, one of them is the temperature anomaly, which is uh, measured by satellite because I trust those boys, and the Mauna Loa measurements of CO2. The second set of data I have, uh, extends over a longer time. Uh, I've used NASA GIST data. Uh, there are the uh, references to it. I simply pulled the data out and looked at it in the following way. Uh, on the left, you see the atmospheric CO2. On the right, you see the satellite temperature anomaly. And I choose a time, March, say, in 1985, and I read off one of each of those values. And from 1880 on, this is NASA GIST data, I take uh, for each year I get a CO2 concentration and a temperature anomaly, and then I start making up a, a, a graph now, you might be asking, what is CO2? What's the C0 value and the T0 value? Just say that at some given time, we have a value C0 and T0. It's not terribly important. The data look like that in a table, T0, T1, T2, carbon dioxide concentration, C0, and so forth. I take the logarithm of the CO2 ratio, and I take the temperature anomaly and subtract uh, the T0 from it. And then I have then a table of logarithms and delta Ts as I go down. Notice, by the way, that there is a zero on each scale. Plot those data. And we don't get any eye candy because the zero, zero is always on the graph. It is impossible to slide one graph up and down relative to the other, or back and forth. It's impossible. You can stretch it if you want to, but you never change the physical slope. So here I have the satellite data since 1979. And you'll notice that the zero, zero is on the graph. And there is a, uh, well, it looks like you shot it with a so shotgun. Uh, but uh, let's find the, uh, the parameters of that least squares fit. Uh, Gamma plus tau there is equal to 2.78 degrees Celsius. The R squared is not impressive. It's a correlation coefficient of about 50%, but the R squared, 27%. Well, that's a really a short length of time. So now I'll go back to three millionths of 1% of the age of the Earth, uh, namely 130 years, 1880 to the present. The zero, zero is on the graph again. And this time, <clears throat> you'll notice a gamma plus tau with the slope of that line is 2.884 Celsius versus 2.78 in the satellite data. But the R squared is a very impressive uh, 81%. Okay? Now... Take that graph, take that 2.884. We have gamma plus tau is 2.884. Gamma plus tau log two is two degrees Celsius, which means now the sensitivity is defined as gamma log two, and that would be 2.0, providing that tau equals zero. In other words, assuming that warming water does not emit CO2. Well, that's a false assumption, but we are talking about what, I mean, if the IPCC can do things, well, we can make that too. But the upshot of it is that this establishes an upper limit to the sensitivity because gamma and tau are both inherently positive. Here's the NASA data shown, shown with the best fit, uh, which corresponds to a sensitivity of two degrees. 
And uh, I also have three other graphs in there representing two and a half, three, and three and a half degrees. They clearly disagree violently uh, with the data. And uh, let me show you the sensitivity according to the IPCC. We have this graph right here. Uh, by the way, for those of you who are in love with models, I would dearly love to know which one of these models uh, settled the science so we could quit funding the rest. Uh, that's the upper limit right there, obtained from real, honest-to-God data. Here are some values from the IPCC, that, uh, the uh, um, ranges there, 2.1 to 8.9, 1.0 to 9.3. Uh, Gregory et al. Uh, unhelpfully come up with 1.1 to infinity for the sensitivity. Uh, there's more of them like that. Um, another figure uh, from the uh, AR4 uh, talking about uh, likelihood of uh, climate sensitivity in various ranges and so forth. And just for the fun of it, I put on a uh, prediction using a sensitivity of uh, 9 degrees. So uh, I think that one, we probably, anything that says anything like that really ought to be defunded uh, as soon as possible. Well, thank you for listening, and it's your turn. I'm breathless. That was quite an exercise there, doctor. <laughs> thank you. Anyway. Uh, this is